howdy, y'all. Happy 2019, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Gong Fu Tea Cha, filmed in beautiful Austin, Texas, at the splendid Guan Yin Tea House. Can you guess what type of tea we're going to make today? If you are very astute, you might be able to tell from my setup. You might be able to tell from my teapot made of clay, from my round clay cha pan, and from my three cups. One, two, three. Where's my gong da bei, you might ask. I'm not using one today. Have I given you enough hints? Can you guess? That's right. Today I am using Chaozhou style gong fu cha technique to steep Phoenix oolongs, which are from the Phoenix Mountains just north of Chaozhou. This is one of my favorite kinds of tea. And I'd say along with Sheng Pu'er, Phoenix oolongs are my favorite kind of tea. And the reason I like them so much is because they are so remarkably complex and diverse. They're probably the most diverse single category of tea uh, among the oolongs, which are the most complex teas, they are definitely the most varied and diverse. And the reason for that is that the Phoenix oolongs are single bush teas. They say Feng Huang Dan Song Cha, that's the name of this tea in Chinese. And Feng Huang means Phoenix, Dan Song means single bush or thicket shrub ish thing. And what they're referring to is the mother plant, the mother tree. These oolong plants don't get into big, big, tall trees, although they get pretty tall. They do it pretty tall, but not like poor trees that get like way, way tall. Uh, they actually do it pretty tall, but most of them aren't. Most of them are kind of little short bushes. And so they take a mother bush and they take clones of this mother bush and they propagate them. And you, when you pick the right plant to propagate to a clone, then uh, you choose it for its fragrance and its distinctive character. And then when you make the clones of that one plant and you harvest them all together, you end up with a varietal, which is made from a cultivar and they have a distinctive character because you have taken this one, one particular plant and her clones and you have harvested them and processed them together and you get something very refined and unique and so the world of Phoenix Oolongs is this extremely refined, unique world. So we're gonna go ahead and start with one of my favorite Phoenix Oolongs because I really had to work hard to get this one and it appeared to me first as sort of a kind of a legend and here, I'll bring us over here so we have uh, our three Phoenix Oolongs that we're gonna make today here. And you can see they all look kind of exactly the same. Uh, and, but when we're done steeping them, they're not gonna look the same. The leaves are gonna change color and you'll get to see what the original leaf looked like. But in their finished state, they are mostly, the, I'd say that these are all uh, low, mid, and high. I kind of tried, tried to choose low, mid, and high oxidation Oolongs. But you can't see in the dry leaf like this, you can mostly just see uh, and after they're re-steeped and rehydrated, uh, the difference in oxidation. But there's a little bit of variation in leaf size. But we're gonna start with one called Thunderstruck. And I love this tea because A, it provides a great foil for explaining the nature of this extremely refined and specific cloning process. Thunderstruck, I found out about several years ago in Chaozhou while I was visiting a tea farmer uh, who was the uncle of the person whose inn I was staying at. And, um, and I didn't end up actually liking any of his tea very much, but he was a cool guy and he knew a lot about tea. And he was talking to me all about all these, he was trying to emphasize how weird and specific the world of Phoenix Oolongs is, of, of Dan Song Chai's. And he was like, oh, there's one called Ao Pu Ho, which means uh, behind the ditch, you know? And then it's called that because the mother plant is from behind a ditch and they had to name it something. And then there's, uh, all these, you know, obscure, strange varieties that he mentioned. And then there's Lei Gong Da, struck by the thunder god, uh, is what that means. Lei Gong is a thunder god. He has a bird face. He's got a hammer. It's like, he's pretty cool, you know, Taoist deity. And uh, Lei Gong Da means struck by the thunder god. And the reason it's called that is because some 90-something years ago, some unspecified 90-something years ago, a eight immortals tree, a variety called a varietal cultivar called eight immortals, used to make a varietal called Eight Immortals. A cultivar called Eight Immortals, we just looked this up, so I'm, I'm just trying to be real specific on this uh, language here. But uh, a cultivar called Eight Immortals, one of the classic Phoenix Oolong uh, cultivars, was struck by lightning and rent in two, killing half of the tree and the other half surviving was changed. It did not taste like regular Ba Xian, Eight Immortals, anymore. It had a different taste, a different smell, and a different character. It had different qi. And this particular plant, either because of the lightning or just because of the trauma or for whatever reason, ended up becoming a new mother plant of its own varietal cultivar and uh, giving rise to the varietal Lei Gong Da. And, uh, and they have been cloning this one 
thunderstruck, lightning struck plant for the past 90 something years. And that's what we're drinking first today. And when I heard about this, when he told me about this, I was like, oh my gosh, that is amazing. Do you have any? He's like, no, I don't. I was like, oh, well, do you know where to get it? He's like, no, I don't know where to get it. My friend brought it over one time. He had some, I don't remember where he got it. I was like, can you ask him? He's like, uh, I don't even remember who it was really. I was like, okay, well, do you know anyone who has it? And he's like, no. I was like, well, okay, what do I do? Like, what, how do I find it? He's like, I don't know. And then I left, I went to go to Yunnan for like um, a month, you know, and, and, uh, and then, uh, and actually I was with Mary Cotterman and she made all this stuff I'm using right now, not all of it. She made the teapot and she made this cha pan, so. Uh, and she lived in Chaozhou and studied pottery in Chaozhou, so it makes sense that my Chaozhou teapot is made of Mary Cotterman's Chaozhou teaware. Huh, anyways, we went to Yunnan, we came back, to Chaozhou and um, the, I, I went crazy looking for this tea, this tea right here, Thunderstruck. And I just went to all these little tea shops and I would ask people about it and some people would be like, nah, there's no such thing, that's a trick, you've been tricked. See this, see this? That's how they do in Chaozhou, for real though, they actually do this. So it's just gonna be crazy. We're just gonna drink this tea and it's gonna be crazy. But they really do like that. They really do like this in Chaozhou. Uh, there's a dude that I know, he just stuffs his guy one so full that it doesn't even close, and it's not until, actually, we're doing it like that. We're doing it, we're doing that, we're doing it like this. So, we got back to Chaozhou. I went crazy looking for uh, this famous oolong. Oh, I'm gonna put my clips back. This famous oolong. And, or not famous, kind of obscure oolong, but we were looking for it, and people were like, oh, there's no such thing, that was a trick, you've been fooled, or it's, it's made up. And then some other people would be like, oh yeah, I've, I've heard of that thing, but I've never tried it. And some people were like, oh yeah, I had it some once, but I don't know where to get it. And uh, finally, one day, I was walking by this tea shop on Pai Fang Jie, on the, or right off of Pai Fang Jie, which is the main little like cool place, uh, cool old city street in Chaozhou, and And there we go. I saw this tea shop, and there were these like there were three like octogenarians hanging out in this tea shop, and I'm like, all right, that's the spot. Yeah, that's just how we do, like that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there were these old dudes hanging out, and I was like, well, that's probably the spot. And so I went in, and the the the, the owner was a gentleman named Ah Long, and I had some tea with him, and he sampled a couple of different teas with me. Mmm, smell of vision, wish we had it. Um, and then he, uh, I asked him, eventually, we hung out, hung out for like a little while, and then I asked him if he'd ever heard of a tea called Le Gong Da. And he was like, yeah, I've heard of that. And I was like, what's the deal? And he told me that story. And I'd already heard the story. You gotta be, you gotta be sly when you're in China. You don't wanna let people know what you know when you're looking for a thing. Because what you don't want is to uh, have someone just be like, oh yeah, I've got that. And then just go grab some of whatever and be like, here it is. Here's a, give me, give me 5,000 kwai for this gin of tea, um, which is a lot of money for not that much tea, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, yeah, um, okay, we can drink this one. And, uh, and I was like, okay, well, what's, what's the story? He's like, it got hit by lightning. I'm like, okay, and do you know where to get it? He's like, I have it. And I was like, oh, cool, can we try some? And he went and he got the tin, and the tin said Le Gong Da on it already. It was printed out. He couldn't have gone and done it while I wasn't looking. So it was like ready to rock. And so he brought this tin back and he made it, and it was this tea, and it was awesome, and I loved it. And I still love it. It's one of my all time favorite teas. And Ah Long made all of these teas that we're drinking today. That's the moral of the story is that if you go on a crazy Legend of Zelda quest looking for a tea, then you will find probably more than you even thought you would find, which is a fantastic tea master who is fourth generation Chaozhou tea master, and we're super proud to be able to ca uh, carry his teas. Uh, we're the only people in America who do, and we're super excited about it. And he has all these weird, weird, and Usual varieties. I just got one called uh, uh, Hai Lao Chen, which means to fish a needle from the bottom of the sea. The Phoenix Oolongs have the best names, including, um, uh, you know, and uh, they all have crazy stories or some bizarre reason why they're called what they are. And uh, the trick with Phoenix Oolongs is that they're all so specific that when you're processing them, uh, this is Along's job. He's a tea master, not a tea farmer. He doesn't grow the tea, 
He just buys the fresh leaves, and he's been, his family's been doing this for four generations. Uh, his great-grandfather started the, uh, the, the operation. And you go in the spring, you, ch you look at the fresh leaves, and you ch just decide what's going to be good. You have connections with farmers. You decide, oh, this is good this year. I'm going to process this. But you also have to know that plant well enough to understand how much to cook it and how much to oxidize it and what to do with it, how much to massage it, how much to wither it after it's been massaged, all the stuff that you end up doing. And then you have to have the skill, the technical skill of charcoal roasting, the tanbei step charcoal roasting process. And that is the high art of oolong making is to roast the leaves with this white charcoal in a big basket with your hands. And he's good at it. He's real good at it. And his kids are learning how to do it. He's got a daughter and a son, and they're both learning how to do this. So uh, that's the story of Thunderstruck and Along. And um, I guess what's, uh, I'm going to drink a little bit right now because I'm talking about it. Yep, real good. Wish you could taste it. So the reason they started doing this little tiny teapot thing with the three cups is because Phoenix oolongs, like all oolongs, are extremely complex. But when you make them, you also have to have a lot of control. Like I just mentioned, you need a lot of control and specificity in breeding them. You need a lot of control and specificity in processing them. And you need a lot of control and specificity in the service of them. So when I'm serving Thunderstruck, when I'm serving Lei Gong Da, I'm using pretty hot water, I'd say about, 205, if I'm going to put a number on it, something along those lines, maybe even hotter. Uh, sometimes they use straight boiling hot water. But there are special ways of pouring each Phoenix along, and it takes time to master them. Learning a new tea is like learning a song, and Phoenix Oolongs are especially tricky. They really take a little bit of interfacing with and sitting down with and playing with and paying attention to to really get them uh, down. And in fact, the last three teas that I got, including this one right here, Yang Mei Xiang, our second tea that we're going to make. And I'll, we'll, we'll show you the fully steeped leaves these at the end, but you can see there's, uh, there's the color of the tea as these are, are slowly losing their, their darkness. And we'll do these at the end with many more infusions on them. Um, I'm just going to put this guy around here. I got a little spot for him. All right. And now we're going to switch to a Gaiwan for our second Phoenix Young. And I'm just going to, just going to do this. Yeah. I'm just going to drink these right here. Don't worry, boys. We'll have more. Because i got to make the next tea, which is going to be Yang Mei Xiang. The, um, which means... Uh, this is new, this one's new to me. Uh, Yang Mei is a fruit called Yang Mei, uh, but in, it's a super fruit. They decided it's one of these super fruits that has all these antioxidants, so they've rebranded it in the West as Yumberry. And I'm really at a, I'm having like an ethical dilemma about whether I can actually call this tea Yumberry fragrance Phoenix Oolong. Um, we'll see. I'm on the fence. I'm still deciding. I'm going to go, I'm going to go uh, kind of, uh, classico style here because I want a I want a cup of tea myself and I want to use a gaiwan so you can see what I do with this funny technique that we do with Phoenix Yulongs and I want a Hui Wei Bei so we can save that and do that at the end. Um, but yeah, yum berry fragrance. Yang Mei Xiang Phoenix Yulong is one of these. Oh, and I, I have a list. I'll get to it later of what the 10 originals were. Um, and this is probably a good time to tell the story of the Phoenix Yulongs. Like many things in tea world, they have a cute and funny origin story. And uh, it involves the emperor of the Song Dynasty fleeing the invading Mongolians at the beginning of the Yuan Dynasty. Uh, and this is a period in Chinese history when China was for about a hundred years, ruled by the Mongolians who invaded and took control of China for a little while, and um, that's the Yuan Dynasty, and it, pre it succeeded the Song Dynasty. So at the end of the Song Dynasty, we have the Yuan Dynasty, and so this story involves the Song Emperor fleeing south away from the invading Mongols, and if you keep going south and south and south, eventually you will get to the uh, South China Sea, and you'll get to Zhaozhou, which is right on the water, uh, if you're in that part of South China Sea. And that's where he was, and he was in the Phoenix Mountains down there in eastern Guangdong province, where this tea comes from. And, uh, but at that time, tea didn't grow there. And this is kind of a creation myth or like a, a myth to explain how the tea plant got to this area, because the tea plant originates further west 
in southwestern China, like Yunnan and Guizhou, Guangxi, places like that. And so how did tea get to the Phoenix Mountains? Well, when the Song Emperor was fleeing the Mongols, they were traveling through the mountains and he was with his bodyguards, you know, his guards that were there to protect him. And he became parched and he goes, I can go no further. I must have some tea before I can go on. And his bodyguards were like, sorry, your highness, there is no more tea. We drank all the tea or you drank all the tea. I bet only he gets to drink tea on the trip. Um, and he's like, no, no, I can't. I must have tea <laughs> and I can't take another step. And then uh, the, uh, and he's like, well, let's, let's, let's make some tea. And he's like, well, we can't make tea. The bodyguards say, we can't make tea. There is no tea in the Phoenix Mountains. And luckily, because the emperor is the son of heaven, uh, the clouds parted and a rainbow f came down and on it flew a phoenix. A phoenix flew down on a rainbow is what I'm saying, with a tea branch in her mouth. And she landed and presented this tea branch on the ground to the emperor. And the emperor took it and instinctively stuck it into the ground where it turned into a, immediately grew into a big, beautiful tea bush with 10 fruits. And it had these 10 fruits on it. And they took these 10 fruits, the emperor gathered these 10 fruits up in his pocket and he scattered them throughout the Phoenix Mountains. And those became the 10 original Xiangxing flavor, fragrance types. This, I guess, kind of the 10 original foundational fragrances of Phoenix Zulong. And there is a list of them that I will recite in some kind of cutscene or something like that. Um, but uh, that is how the Phoenix Zulongs came to be. That is how the, the tea plant arrived in the Phoenix Mountains. And at that time, they didn't use them to make Oolong tea. There was no such thing as Oolong tea. They would have made something like green tea. Uh, or they would have like powdered it. I guess the end of the Song Dynasty. I don't know what kind of tea they would have made. but. At any rate, uh, it wasn't Oolong. Oolong came later in the Wuyi Mountains, further east. But they were in the Phoenix Mountains first. The tea plant, that is, was in the Phoenix Mountains first. And the technique came later in the Wuyi Mountains and made its way back west, is my understanding. So now we're going to get down and nitty gritty with the details uh, of how to steep this tea well, because we're talking about how it requires so much special care and attention. There we go. And so I'm going to give us a nice fat gaiwan full so we can see how it, how it works. What do we do here? And uh, there's a special technique for the Phoenix Oolongs and it involves kind of like with Sheng Puer, it's kind of about um, getting a full flavor while, while uh, excluding bitter and astringent tastes because the Phoenix Oolongs, unlike Anxi and Wu Yi Oolongs, does have the potential to become bitter. So it presents a challenge in that sense because all of that delicious complexity and uniqueness is guarded by the bitterness monster. And so we need to be very careful when we're steeping it. And we also employ a technique that we talked about before when making sheng puars, which is the cha dan, the cha dan being the tea gall, like the gall bladder of the tea. Remember that? If you've seen the sheng puar episode, then you can remember that one. Anyways, what it is is an imaginary organ in the center of the mass of tea leaves that one must not puncture. And we puncture it by pouring water on it. So what we're gonna do is avoid pouring water straight onto the mass of leaves. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you. My water here is, I'm gonna use this Yang Mei. This is really particular. Here's what I learned about this Yang Mei fragrance. The first two times I made it, it wasn't very good. And then I figured out that you have to start it with pretty cool water. And then you get warmer. And for the rinse, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and get it all over because it's just the rinse. After that is when I'm gonna avoid that cha dan, that tea gall. But uh, it's gonna cool a little bit more first. And like I said, it took me a couple tries to get this tea to actually work right. And that is the fun and exciting thing about Phoenix Oolongs is that you really do have to practice with them. They take a lot of skill, every aspect of them, the growing, the processing, and the service of them take a lot of skill and attention. And so, yeah, y'all can't taste it anyway, that'll do. Just gentle though. I'm, even though I'm going right in the middle, I'm being gentle and I'm being quick. I'm just gonna go ahead and give it a real quick rinse. Ain't that pretty. Look at that color. Ooh, yeah, it's gonna be good. Yep, just like a yum berry. 
And then just get the last, you really want to do this with the phoenixes. You really want to get those last few drops out. Oh, I guess it's all good. Nice. And look at those leaves. Look at those luscious leaves. Can you see them? Yeah, there we go. All right, that's going to be my Huey Wei Bay, my returning flavor cup. I'll drink it at the end. I don't care if people don't like that I do that. I like it. Uh, and then I'm going to go ahead. Now is the funky, funny part of this process. I'm going to go ahead and get my water cooled down and to temp. This is the one where it really matters how I pour, this beginning part. Yeah, a little more. You can always throw the extra away. This is the part that really matters, and I'm gonna harken back to our, our green tea making style here, and I'm gonna actually feel this water and smell this tea because it is so particular. And let me describe the smell to you as long as I'm sitting here smelling this wonderful tea. It smells, it's got, they've got notes of uh, some evaporated milk kind of creaminess notes, and you've got like a dried strawberry, and we kind of decided that that made it have the impression of being like the strawberry part of the Neapolitan astronaut ice cream was the closest tasting note that we could get. Uh, eerily accurate, I guess you'll just have to try it if you wanna know. And you could say also yumberry, yangmei, although, yeah, it kind of tastes like yangmei, but unless you've had yangmei, that's not very helpful. Um, say that's about good. So here's what you do. This technique's called ding dian, which means fixed point, is what I've heard it called. And we're going to avoid breaking the cha dan here, and we're gonna do that by pouring here. The first time, we're just gonna pour here. I'm not gonna go around in a circle. I'm just gonna pour right here. And then I'm, when I'm done, I'm going to next time pour like here. And then the next time after that, I'm gonna pour like here. And I'm gonna go around like the face of a clock. And that way, I am getting every little pie slice of this cha di, the, uh, the, the tea floor, every portion of it is being given an opportunity to be the first hit with the water. And you kind of portion out the flavor of this tea by kind of rationing it with a very gentle pour right down one side. And the leaves are so mass, uh, voluminous, they can't move. And so I'm just gonna be scooping up one little segment of the tea's flavor in each pour that I do. And after like five or six or seven of those, the cha dan is diffused. It is no longer a potentially bitter spot and then you can pour right on it. And that's when you can up the temperature a little bit and really crank out the last little uh, bit of flavor. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this is ready to rock. It really does like to start cool, but then it warms up. Oh yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna demonstrate this. I'm gonna start at six o'clock as in the direction, not the time. It's like 2 a.m. right now. I'm not gonna wait till six. I'm doing it now. There we go. And I use that cool water and a gentle pour. Yes. All right, there's that yumber. Nice and soft, and as we make more steepings, it is gonna brighten up. And what I learned from practicing with this tea and making this tea two times before I really, really got it where I liked it, was that it really wants that first, at first I made it pretty, pretty right. I started soft, but then I never went, I never really got hot enough. And I was so focused on doing this ding dian technique that I, um, I wasn't paying enough attention to the temperature, and so I was making it too soft, and I, or no, it came out good. It was really good, and I was like, okay, but the first steepings were a little soft. Like, you see, um, or you saw how light it was when I just did it, and I was like, maybe I should start hotter, because you never know what a tea's actually like until you play around with it, what it what, how it's gonna respond to different temperatures. And so the next time I made it, I made it hotter, and it was too hot, and then uh, I think it was three times I made this, and then the next time after that, I. I got it because I started it cool and did it hot later. And then it was still soft to start off with, but that's just the way it's gonna be at the beginning. This tea, this Yangmei fragrance is just, starts off soft with a lot of that creamy evaporated milk note up front. And then, yeah, that's right. And then it moves to being um, uh, with that dried strawberry taste, that fruity taste. And at the end, it ends with a floral note that 
we decided was like roses. Like there's a rose note and uh, and a little bit of um, uh, jasmine kind of note. So it's a very dynamic tea, and it just does start soft, starts cool and starts soft, and then uh, moves through the progression of flavors if you do it just so. And maybe there's other ways to do it that are also really good, but that's the best way I found, is with cool water at the beginning and cranking up the heat in the later steepings. I'm just gonna combine, I'm just gonna do a few more, I'm gonna do two more in this Gong Da Bay just so we can watch this awesome process of the uh, pouring here. It's pouring in this new part that I haven't poured yet. And this third steeping, I'm using hotter water. Coming straight from the kettle, we're probably about 200 degrees, 190 degrees right now. Go. Yeah, all righty. And so after a few steepings, I will start to hybridize my technique. I always try to, when I teach this technique to people, I always have to unteach it because you don't want to get stuck in this mindset of every time I pour, I have to use this technique. On the next one, I might start doing it. I might be here at 12 o'clock and then I might swirl it around a little bit. Because if that's what the last steeping is telling me I should do on the next one, you know, you don't want to get too dogmatic about these things. This is what works well, and that's why we do it. If something else works better, do that. And, but the, that degree of, of fine-tuned attention is very um, characteristic of what you're going to need to do to make these Phoenix Oolongs well. It makes them really fun and really uh, interesting. It's like a mystery that you have to kind of solve. And I guess I just get to drink all the tea today because I can't think of, we don't need to, I don't need to do a thing. I'm just gonna drink it. I'm gonna try some of this one here too. These are your steepings. Hmm, yes. All right, so I picked one more for this particular um, tasting today, and that is Gui Hua Xiang, Osmanthus Fragrance, Phoenix Oolong, and this is the last one here. I picked this one because this is a truly low oxidation Phoenix Oolong, and it has um, a greener flavor, a more floral flavor, kind of like, um, um, like a, a low oxidation anxi oolong, like, um, or a Taiwanese oolong, for example. And Phoenix oolongs have this dynamic range, uh, more so, I would say, than Wu Yi oolongs, for example, or anxi oolongs. Anxis, you tend to be really, really, really low oxidation or really, really high oxidation. The traditional charcoal roasted ones tend to be high, and then the more modern uh, kind that come vacuum sealed tend to be quite low. And um, Wu Yi oolongs tend to be high oxidation in general. Uh, or in my experience, because they're all the best ones, you know, are roasted with charcoal and that you kind of end up with this, this uh, high oxidation state. But you do have a low oxidation charcoal roasted Phoenix oolongs, um, especially the winter harvests of the Phoenix oolongs tend to be very green, sometimes looking green in color, the leaves themselves when they're done. Um, but a lot, oftentimes looking black like this and then turning green uh, as you steep them. And we didn't quite get there with this one. I'll do one more just to kind of take a little bit of color and so I'm gonna really go strong on this last steeping because I'm now I'm no longer steeping the tea so much to drink because I want to be able to show you how this tea changes color um, when we are done with the leaves. But it's also gonna be a nice strong tea, which is how people in Chaozhou drink their tea. It's nice and strong. All right, there we go. Yeah, you're starting to see this very variegated color, some green and some darker hues in there. And I'm just gonna go ahead and rinse this guy out. Boop, 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 boop. And so when you have these 
varietals being produced from these cultivars that people develop. There we go. It becomes kind of, um, you know, you have this, this market that becomes kind of obsessed, a little bit obsessed with all these different, very specific types of teas, and people start to develop their own cultivars, and they start to breed their own cultivars, or, uh, and, and it's this very uh, intensive process. So for example, Thunderstruck happened because like, it has a mutant origin story, it makes it unique, but that Yangmei fragrance, it's not one of the 10 original uh, fragrance types. And so how did it come about? Someone had to breed it. Uh, it means someone picked out some existing plants of varying pedigree, all from the Phoenix Mountains, descended from these 10 original fragrances, and breed them together. And when you breed uh, a plant, you don't get a clone, you get a genetically distinct offspring. Uh, you get many of them, you get many seeds, and each one of those seeds is a genetically unique individual. And each one of them will produce a, a tea plant uh, that could be its own cultivar and will have its own distinctive characteristics. And so you do this process, um, you breed the plants together, you get the seeds, you plant the seeds, and then you wait a couple years before you taste them even because they're not necessarily gonna have any distinctive attributes until they're a couple years old. And then you pick the ones that you like, you're like, okay, this one, I'm gonna call this Yangmei fragrance because it tastes like Yangmei to me and I'm gonna raise it up and I'm gonna clone it and you gotta raise it up to be a much bigger plant. You could be waiting another five to seven years uh, before you're, it's big enough to really wanna take a bunch of clones from because clones are taken from cuttings and if you take a cutting from a little bitty plant, you could kill the plant. You have to wait till the plant gets big enough for it to be safe. And so you don't wanna overtax the plant and so every year you can make X amount of clones and each generation of clones has to be raised to be two or three years old before you can start to harvest tea from it. And so by the time, from the time that you, from this breeding event until the time you have a couple kilograms of dry tea leaves to sell at the market could be decades. And so this is a very laborious process. It's a very, uh, requires a lot of expertise and most of our requires patience because it could be 20 years before you've got a whole varietal of tea that you can sell that is yours. But the big payoff is that if you do develop your own cultivar and make your own varietal, then uh, you make your own dan song cha, you make your own single bush tea. If it's good and it's new and you're the only one who has it, you can pretty much set your own price for it because tea people love to have something that is new and rare and nobody else has it. And uh, so what would happen is that unscrupulous tea farmers, uh, I'm told, I'm not pointing any fingers here, unscrupulous tea farmers would see, I'm not wasting this tea, I'm gonna have to, have to figure something out to do with all this tea. Um, unscrupulous tea farmers would see their neighbors engaged in this process and they would sneak over in the middle of the night and surreptitiously take cuttings of the mother plant, thus actually not only would that, are they stealing the plant, which is this person's creation, um, but they're also taxing that mother plant and they're, you know, it's like this butchery and they're making the plant susceptible to disease and, you know. So you've got this uh, situation where it it's, does double harm to the person who's actually growing and raising this mother plant and is developing this varietal. And so uh, the story goes that um, because this process is so vulnerable and takes so long. Uh, uh, there's a story of one particular tea, which is a very, very popular tea now, and uh, it was originally called Wu Jiao Zai, the dark-legged one, which is a really cool name for a tea that someone should bring back. But it's not called that anymore, uh, it, it, because its originator uh, had these Snoopy neighbors snooping around, and apparently they had problems with their plants getting stolen and, and uh, 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 counterfeited, you know, and. So uh, when their neighbors asked them, oh, hey, I see you're working on this new plant. What do you call that one? They replied, I call this one uh, Yashir Xiang Duck Sh Fragrance. And the name stuck, and it is called Duck Sh to this day. And it is a delicious tea. It's fantastic. It is in its low oxidation state. It tastes like honeysuckle. In its high oxidation state, it has this cool, mellow, fruity taste. But its real name is Duck Sh and I was not joking when I said that Phoenix Oolongs have crazy names. That is, that's not even a rare one. That one's famous. Everybody knows about that one. Uh, I, I can spot a duck shit tree, actually. I have seen this plant enough times that in a field of Phoenix Oolongs, I can be like, that's duck shit. Anyway, 
We're not drinking that right now, though. We're going a little bit more OG classic than that. This is Osmanthus fragrance, Guihua Xiang. Osmanthus is the name of a flowering olive. It is a beautiful scent. It is one of my absolute, all right, fine. I'm gonna do it like this. I'm gonna do it like this, because we got to. It's one of my favorite fragrances of all time, uh, is the Osmanthus flower. And um, this tea really does smell and taste like it. Another, another uh, tea that has a floral name, another Phoenix Loom that has a floral name, and ends up being uh, very, very similar to the way that it actually does, the, the flower it's named after actually does smell is Magnolia fragrance, Yulan Xiang, and that's one of Mary Cotterman's favorites, um, who made all this teaware. Well, not this guy one. I'm gonna go ahead and So I'm gonna go ahead and like rinse the cups, rinse my gong that by being a good tea server. And I'm gonna cool this one quite a bit too, because this is a low oxidation tea. Mm. The ten originals we'll talk about, but the the point uh, is that I've seen so many different lists of what the 10 original phoenixes are, and I honestly don't know if anyone really, really, really knows. And you can go on Baidu, you can go on Chinese internet and look up in Chinese what are the 10 original phoenixes, and you know what? If you can find me a good source that cites anything and actually lists 10 phoenix fragrances, phoenix fragrance types, I will I will uh, send you an ounce of this tea. The first person who can actually find me a source on Chinese internet that lists the names of the 10 original Phoenix uh, Xiangxing fragrance types, then I will literally send the first person who does that and I will tell the world on Instagram that we did this. I will send you an ounce of this tea because God dang it, I can't find it. I cannot find a source that, of course I went and looked on Baidu. Of course, you, what do you want to know something? You go Google it. Well, okay, Google doesn't know because it's Chinese stuff, so you go to Baidu, that's like the Chinese Google. They're always like, there's 10 original, they tell that story that I just told about the Phoenix and the Emperor, and then they're like, and they, that was the 10 original types of Phoenix Oolong, and the 10 original types are Jasmine fragrance, Magnolia fragrance, uh, uh, the uh, 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 orchid fragrance, dot, 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 and the others. And I'm like, come on, you just said three of them. You didn't even say 10 of them. Uh, and then when you do, when I do find lists of 10, not even necessarily on the internet, when people tell me, they are never the same. So yeah, um, just goes to show, tea stuff is like that. And don't get too hung up about it because you're just cruising for a bruise and if you're gonna care too much about that sort of thing because you just can't know sometimes. All right, let me get this bad boy going. Osmanthus fragrance, excited to have this back. We have, we have not had this for a little bit. They finish roasting these Dansong Cha in the fall. So you don't get, you don't really, you can get fresh Dansong in the spring and it's good, but it doesn't stay good. You know what I mean? Like it's good and then like six months later, it's not as good. If you wait until the fall, when they actually finish processing it, then it's better. I know it's the rinse, I just wanted to taste it. I feel bad wasting all this tea. It's for, it's for, it's for all y'all. It's for, this is for you, the viewer. The sacrifices we make in service of the art. All right, and this isn't even the one that's hot. There we go. Uh, yeah, still gonna use cool water though. I'm not sacrificing that much. Still gonna cool the water. But, yeah, just like Osmanthus. 
if you have smelled osmanthus, uh, it, it really is one of the most lovely fragrances. And if you haven't, maybe you have and you didn't know it because they do grow them in America sometimes. And it smells like summer. One really charming thing about the Chaozhou tea service, which we'll, we'll probably do a thing about just about Chaozhou tea service specifically in a different episode. But one thing that I really love about Chaozhou and that I think is really charming is that in addition to their weird only using three cups, no, no gong da bei situation, they use a charcoal stove to heat their water. And it's really lovely because you don't have to do that anymore. No one needs that. But they take the time to do it. Not everybody, but a lot of people still do. Take the time to take charcoal, light the charcoal, and heat their water, which is a slow and painstaking process. But it is lovely and actually does, I think really does make the tea taste better. The water that's been boiled in there, their unglazed sand pots has a really soft quality to it that complements these teas well. So yeah, cheers to Chao Zhou. I'll be seeing you soon. Oh boy. Mm. And I just want to do a color comparison here. I'll do, I'll do go ahead and do three steepings of this one too so we can do a color comparison, but but uh, this is a much lighter, greener color here because it's a lower oxidation. That Yang Mei would be a mid-oxidation. That Thunderstruck we started with was, uh, uh, I don't know, 70% oxidized, if I just had to guess. Uh, honestly, don't know. I don't know if Alon knows the percentage either. He probably would say something like that. Um, but um, I'm just going to go a little hotter here and get those three steepings out. Um, but you can see a much lower oxidation tea with a greener color. and has this really sweet, delicate floral fragrance, which, again, to truly understand the breadth and variety of the Phoenix Ongs, you just have to taste them. I just did a, a Phoenix-only tea tasting at the tea house, and we drank Thunderstruck, and we drank uh, Jasmine fragrance, and we drank uh, needle, to fish a needle from the sea floor. Hai Di Lao Chen. Great, I love that tea. And that one was super challenging, I, and I appreciate it more because it challenged me. It was a worthy, a worthy tea not adversary, but you know, uh, worthy tea to make and is really fantastic when you get it just right. And it's so gratifying to get one just right. It's a lot of the fun of this practice is, you know, learning a tea is like learning a song and, and when you really get it down, just the act of doing it because you've spent that time to learn how to do it right is in itself gratifying. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah, yeah, that's nice, that's nice. Well, so that's Phoenix Oolongs for you, the wild, wacky, wonderful world of the Feng Huang Dan Song Cha, the Phoenix Oolongs, one of my absolute favorite kinds of tea. And I'd say along with, um, while Sheng Puar, my other favorite kind of tea, represents kind of the, the purity and, and singularity of tea, the Danzong on the other end, the oolong end of the spectrum, represents the diversity and specificity of not seed-propagated individuals, but the highly refined uh, varietals produced from distinct cultivars that have been laboriously bred and painstakingly cloned by skilled farmers and then processed by skilled masters and then hopefully served by a skilled tea pourer, tea server. And uh, and now you know how to be skilled like that, that particular skill. And like I said, use this Ding Dian technique. Don't get too hung up on it. If you want to do something different, then go ahead and do something different. But use a lot of Dan Song Cha that was seven grams. Each one of those was seven grams in this little, maybe 100, 120 mill milliliter gaiwan. And we get this big, poofy quantity of tea here. And uh, yeah, there we go. There you have it, Phoenix Oolongs. 
Hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope that you go out and you get some Dansong Cha, and you get some kind of weird, weird wacky variety, and you try it, and if it's bitter, then don't worry, make it again, and go a little cooler, and if it's not strong enough, then that's okay. You do something a little more dynamic with the water and maybe hit the middle a little bit more, but have fun and enjoy making and serving yourself these wonderful and distinctive teas. Thank you and join us next time for another exciting episode of Gongfu Tea Cha. Mm -hmm.